we want to kind of jump into this morning's message as we are still in our sermon series for the summer dealing with Proverbs. So we're looking at a very special proverb this morning, but before I do that, let's first pause and pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We ask that you will use this time as a means, as a measure, as a way to encourage our hearts and to challenge our souls, to draw us closer and closer to you as you give us insight and instruction from your word. God, I pray and ask on this morning that you would do as only what you can do, and that is remove me and allow your Holy Spirit to take over, so that it's not my words nor my truth, but your words and your truth. I pray and ask, O oh God in heaven, that all of us in the house today will be richly, richly encouraged and edified. And you are a great God in heaven. You and you alone will be glorified. <laughs> we do pray and ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. All God's people said, amen. amen. This morning, we want to look at a unique proverb found in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. If you want to open up your Bibles there, please turn there. It will also be on the screen this week for you to see for yourself also in the event that you don't have a Bible. That's right. almost forgot, y'all. Bible time. Because it's the Bible, we almost forgot we have to stand and recite what we believe about this book. All right. Now, for those of you who are visiting, this is a statement we make each week right before we do our sermon because we want to remind ourselves and inform others that this book right here not only possesses God's word, but it is truth and nuggets for us to live this life to the best of our ability. So if you have a Bible, hold it high. If you have a cell phone, because you use that as a written text with the Bible app, then hold that high in the air. Repeat these words along with us, all in unison together. This is my Bible. I believe it is the infallible, incorruptible, and uncompromising word of God. I believe I can do what it tells me I can do. I believe that when I do what it tells me to do, then I will have what it says I will have in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated at this time. Sorry about that. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, we read the following words. It goes like this. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Now, at first glance, you and I will look at this particular verse and we begin to make assumptions and thought or begin to gather thoughts about what the, what the writer Solomon is actually trying to say. Over the next Mm, so many minutes or so, want to spend some time walking through this particular passage as we kind of break it down clause by clause or phrase by phrase to get the central point that Solomon is trying to communicate to you and I. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. The first thing that he highlights here is the word hatred. Hatred stirs up. He says here, hatred. And if you were to look up this word in Hebrew, hatred is a very uh, very, uh, very much a word that we all pretty much understand. It means to hate, to be hateful or odious. It can often be used in context of enemy or sexual revulsion, okay? All right? So either you hate your enemies or, 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 or not, or in some sense uh, with regards to sexual revulsion, all right? I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but it can be used very interesting throughout the text as there are cases where the word hate is used to express this intense sense of emotion or feeling that one may have towards someone else. When we think about the concept of hatred, in the Bible, hatred is something that is used to express one's emotions, okay? It is a legitimate emotion that you and I may have or experience, and that is the emotion of hatred. Hate is not always a bad emotion to experience or to feel, as even God hates certain things. God hates sin, all right? And so hatred is an emotion that is expressed at times. It is a feeling that you and I will experience and at times have in our own lives. Secondly, in the Bible, hatred is not only a, an emotion that at times is expressed. Hatred can also be something that is, uh, 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 is actually demonstrated. It's an action. So when we talk about hatred, it is something that can be demonstrated because of how we feel uh, or experience, but it is something that also can take place in action. 
Something that the Bible highlights with regards to hatred when it's often being expressed is oftentimes hatred is expressed with regards to the enemies of God. God hates his enemies or he would demonstrate a hatred towards his enemies by what? By annihilating them, by destroying them or practicing or exercising judgment upon them. So we see the concept of hatred. Hatred also can be something that is expressed or I should say an emotion or a feeling that is expressed or a demonstration being demonstrated based upon what you and I should avoid. You will not see these on the screen, but I want to give you a couple of proverbs that I just want you to listen to and hear with regards to some things that you and I should hate, dislike, or disdain. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 15 says this, One who was a guarantor for a stranger will certainly suffer for it, but one who hates being a guarantor is secure. For those of you who don't know what a guarantor is, that's when you co-sign for somebody. And it's saying here that you should hate the idea of co-signing and the actual act that goes along with it. Why? Because you will find security in your own finances when you're not co-signing for everybody else. So you and I should avoid this, all right? I didn't just mess a whole lot of people up, all right? I didn't say it was a sin if you co-sign. I said you should hate the idea and concept of it because, because of what it can do. Secondly, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 7, we read these particular words as the Bible says this. All the brothers of a poor person hate him. How much more do his friends abandon him? So when you come around and your family don't always feel the best, it's probably because you always got your hand out asking for some help. Now, does it literally mean that they hate you and want nothing to do with you? No, it just simply means that they know when you show up, it's going to cost them something, okay? And so they don't particularly enjoy too much when you show up to the party, family get together, or you make a phone call that was unsolicited. Why? Because you are probably wanting something. One more. This one I really enjoy. Proverbs 25 and verse 17 says this, as Solomon writes, let your foot rarely be in your neighbor's house, or he will become weary of you and hate you, all right? Does not mean that he wants nothing to do with you ever. Does not mean that you are the bane of his or her existence. But what it does mean is at times you show up too much. Watch your own TV, eat your own food, chill out in your own home because you got on my last nerve, okay? All right? This often happens at times when people realize that we live next door to the church and then random folks want to show up at all hours of the night. What happens is my wife looks and she's like, mm. And there are sometimes like, baby, just sit there. I'll go get the door because I know in that moment she is hating the fact that folks keep just showing on up. Listen, if you begin to show up too much at your neighbor's house, they not going to like to see you coming as much as you like to see yourself going, okay? All right? And so hatred here is this concept where you and I hate. It is odious. It can be dealing with an enemy or a foe, and sometimes it can even be dealing in the context of sexual revulsion, but ultimately the idea of hate in the book of Proverbs is communicating this concept that you and I are either dealing with emotions that we are feeling, actions that will be expressed, or in some cases, things that we should avoid. Hatred, he goes on to say, stirs up. Here, when we look at the word hatred, and then we see the word stirs up in the Greek, or in the Hebrew, excuse me, excuse me, the idea of stirring up is the idea of to awaken or to be awake, to brandish or will. When this Hebrew word is used throughout the Old Testament, it can also give us the idea of to wield or to brandish, okay? One that was really interesting to me was this concept of to stir oneself or to set in motion. Now, I want to give you some idea here as to why there are so many different ways or explanations or understandings of a particular Hebrew word. Because oftentimes, Hebrew words are used, and because the Hebrew language has a lot less words in the English language, then there are times where a prefix or a suffix or the context of what the word is being written in will determine how it should be used. So... When the writer here says hatred stirs up, he uses a word 
It means to awaken, to brandish. At times it means to wield. It means to stir oneself or to set oneself in motion. It can be to rouse oneself to activity, incite to activity or to set in motion. When I think about this particular concept of stir up at first glance, you and I can use an illustration or image of that which those of us who are coffee drinkers, but you just don't like it black. There are times where if you, <laughs> there are times in which you are like me, you will sometimes put the cream in the cup before the coffee hits the cup. And when you do that, you recognize that if you put the cream in first and the sugar that you may want or et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is that you want, when the coffee hits it, when it hits it, it begins to blend really well and you don't have to do much stirring because in the process of the coffee hitting what is already there, it pretty much stirs itself up. However, there are those moments in which you actually put the coffee in and then you pour the cream in and you see it going in, you know that it's in there, it's taking effect and it even lightens the coffee a little bit, but you go through the process of stirring that which you poured in and as you stir it, the coffee gets lighter and lighter and lighter to your liking. The same thing is true with the sugar. If you put it in, you are stirring it up. Why? Because you do not want it just to go to the bottom and settle there. You want to make sure that it's really fully in and intertwined with the black coffee in which you have just put into your cup. In a similar sense, the concept of stirring up means that something can be there lying dormant. Something is present, but it has not been aroused or awakened. It has not somehow been noticed, and therefore you and I will take something to stir it up, therefore revealing evidence of that which had settled at the bottom. In some sense, what Solomon is saying here is that hatred, this concept of dislike, disdain, or just a, a lack of approval of an individual or a thing, has a tendency to be stirred up. Not that it was not there, but that it was there. It just was lying dormant. It was not aroused. It was not awakened. But all of a sudden, something has acted upon that which was dormant, lying there that was not awakened and caused it to be aroused. And so the idea here is that it is not one that is just brandishing or wielding something. It is that which is being brandished, that which is being wielded. That thing is being used to now affect something that is passively there. And because it is passively there, it has no sense of motion at the moment, but something affects that motion that what? Awakens or arouses that which is dormant, that which is present, to get it to be aroused or awakened, to be something that get set in motion. If you have a spouse, every once in a while you may wake up to someone, what, arousing and awakening you to actually set you in motion to have a good time some mornings, okay? It's not that the desire wasn't there. It's just that the thought wasn't there. It's not that the tools weren't there. It's just that they were lying dormant. But if you do something to set it in motion appropriately, you can arouse and to awake. You have stirred up something that is there. Notice I said married people. The <laughs> Somebody say stir it up. Boy, I tell you what. <laughs> Solomon is trying to communicate here this concept that that which is being stirred up is not being aroused or awakened on its own. It is passive in the process, and therefore something else is causing it to be stirred up, awakened, or aroused. It is now being set in motion. What is Solomon saying? Solomon is basically saying hatred helps. Hatred helps. The question becomes, what does it help? What does it stir up? What causes or, or what has what this thing that has caused it to be stirred up, what does it stir it up to do? Hatred stirs up strife. The word for strife in the Bible in the Hebrew can mean to judge, it can mean to contend, to govern, to administer, it can mean all these things, but it can also mean to argue cause judgment, discord, or strife. 
And Solomon makes this statement here, hatred stirs up strife. He wants you to understand that while this word for strife could mean to judge and to contend because judge and contend and govern and administer can be a good thing, he wants to be very, very clear. The way in which he's using it is a way in which it causes strife, not these other things. And strife from the standpoint of arguments. It causes one to pass judgment or to feel like they're being passed judgment on them. It can create discord. It can also create strife. This is conflict. This is friction. This means that two things or two entities that have come together are not coinciding with one another. They are not necessarily running parallel, but they are running at times in opposition. They are creating some sense of friction. And the point here is that Solomon's trying to tell you what created the friction, what created the issue or the conflict. And what is it that has created that? It is hatred. Solomon is simply saying this. Solomon is talking about an attitude or feelings and emotions, and this is how we could say it. An attitude of animosity arouses or awakens animosity, acrimony, and or antagonism. An attitude of animosity arouses and awakens animosity, acrimony, and or antagonism. While I use all those words, I want you to understand what it can create. Now what's interesting here is Solomon does not say your attitude, he does not say my attitude, he is simply dealing with emotions. He is acknowledging the fact that you and I have legitimate emotions. Sometimes these emotions are of anger. They are of uh, uh, animosity. They are attitudes of uh, 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 feelings and emotions that are legitimate, legitimately real. But then they also will activate something else. At times, your attitude will actually activate antagonism in a situation. In essence, he is saying here a hostile heart will help hostility. Let me put it to you in a more of a a, a worldly perspective. He's basically saying this. He is saying negative energy energizes negative energy. And y'all know what that means. That means that there is an energy in the room that if it is impacting me negatively or if it is coming from a negative source, then all of a sudden, regardless to how I felt, what I was dealing with or how I wanted to be, your negative energy is stimulating enough negative energy in me because it's now in the room. And as a result of that, your negativity has produced negativity back from me. You've seen this at times. Somebody looks at you and says, you know what? You ugly. And you and I look at them and say, who do you think you're talking to? I'll tell you who ugly. You ugly. Your mama ugly. And everything about you is ugly. You and I may have been having a good day, but all of a sudden, someone's attitude towards us, which demonstrated an action, has now activated an animosity in your own heart. So, Solomon is saying here, you and I, at times are dealing with negative energy and respond negatively. But let's make it very plain. What about when you are the one who initiates the negative energy? So there are times it's being initiated and therefore you react to it. There are times you are the one who is initiating the negative energy. Here's what you need to understand, whatever it is you are initiating and whatever type of emotions in which you are emitting, that is what is going to be activated in the situation or circumstance which you are in. I like the fact that he doesn't necessarily say this about one particular thing, meaning a person, a group, a government. He's not talking about people at all times. It could just simply be the energy that is in the room. Now, don't get me wrong, oftentimes energy is emitted or it is created by the individuals who are in the room, but more importantly, he is not simply talking about one particular situation or issue. He just wants you and I to know in general. Negative energy energizes negative energy. Your bad attitude will cause others now to have a bad attitude. So Solomon makes the point here. It's very simple. He's simply saying that here in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, he's very, very clear. Hatred stirs up 
strife. He then gives us a antithetical contrast, but love covers all offenses. But love covers all offenses. Some translations would say transgressions. He makes a statement here, but love. Love, you and I understand, is affection. Love is a Hebrew word that can be interpreted as something that is lovable. One of my commentaries said joys of love, charm, or loveliness. In the Bible, we will see emotions in which one feels. When a man loves a woman, it is communicating this concept of how one feels. Once again, emotions that are in the heart or the mind of the, of the individual, and these emotions are coming out. They are being expressed. They are being felt. But the Bible also tells us in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love is not just feelings in which we feel. And I would be one that argues that while you can feel feelings of love, ultimately love is an action, 1 Corinthians 13, because it's kind, it's patient, it bears no wrong, it suffers long. Love bears all things. Love never, ever fails. And all these are action words and indications that love is doing something, not just feeling something. Okay? Now, again, I don't want to dismiss the fact that love is still a feeling because love is still a feeling. God loves us, and we're talking about emotions. You love this man or this woman, or you love your parents, you love your children, and those are emotions that are generated. But here is the good news. See, love works in such a way that even when I feel like I don't love you, if I act like I love you, my feelings will follow. And so in the Bible, when we talk about this concept of love, we will see it being expressed not only in a literal translation of affection, love, or charm, something that is lovely, but we see it also being expressed in emotions that are felt. And as a result, the emotions that are felt, actions that are then expressed or demonstrated in the life of the one you love. In fact, many of us will say to individuals whom say they love us, if you love me, you wouldn't have done that. That doesn't mean that they don't love you. That just means they didn't demonstrate the actions of love in that moment. Okay? That's what that means. It doesn't mean that they don't love you. They just didn't demonstrate. Now, sometimes they don't love you. Okay? All right? How do you know? Enough of them bad actions demonstrated will tell you, you really don't love me. Okay? You really don't love me. And if you do love me, you have a really bad way of showing me that you love me. So love, when we see this word again, it, 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 it's this idea of not only uh, of words that can describe it, again, affection, love, or charm. It is not just emotions that are felt or experienced in the moment. It is also emotions that now will impact the actions in which we do. Why? Because love is not just how you feel. Love is also what you do. Love. Here in Proverbs or in the wisdom books, meaning Proverbs and Psalms, when the Hebrew word for love is used specifically in Proverbs and also a lot of times in Psalms, it is highlighting an attitude of appreciation and or favorative affection. Love is often seen as a character trait, a character trait that is that is reflected or influenced by right or wrong. In essence, demonstrating again that love is something that we do, and love is understood, it is experienced, it is believed, based upon the action in which you demonstrate in my life that either right or wrong, good or bad, that then further communicate to me that if you say you love me, you really do love me. Why? Because you just don't feel it, but I can see it. Love. He says, love covers. He says, but love covers. He uses the Hebrew word that means to cover. In its general use, it can mean to fill up hollows, to cover hollows, something that has a hole in it. It can mean to cover as in clothing. All right? When you cover someone who is naked, 
then you are clothing that individual. But not only is the idea of covering from nakedness or with clothing, but also for secrecy. When someone tells you something that is deep or dark or something that is personal, intimate to them, so they don't want other people to know, you will at times cover them by not sharing it with others. This Hebrew word and its general use, this is just a general use. When you see this particular word, it can be used all these different ways. Context will determine what type of covering is taking place. But further on, we see the idea of covering to clothe, clothe, conceal, cover, or even to overwhelm. Check that last one out. This word can be used to actually cover someone or cover something, and you overwhelm it. In its general use, this Hebrew word for cover can mean all of these things. Now, it also has a specific use when it's used a certain way that means to conceal shame. All right? To conceal shame. To cover or conceal the nakedness. It's covered with the intent to protect. Okay? And there are times where you and I will cover someone because we don't want them to look bad. If you are a sports player and you play sports, you know that even basketball, if two people are out there, defenders are out there, and I'm guarding my man, and his teammate comes up and sets a pick for me, or a pick on me, then when my guy who I'm guarding will go to the right or to the left of the side of the pick, I will run into an individual who is standing there to help the teammate out. At that moment, I need this particular teammate of mine who is covering this man to now cover me by picking up the man who has now just left me. When you do that, you do that to make sure that we do not look bad, and specifically I do not look bad because someone has gone around me. You cover me. Why? With the intent to protect, the intent to somehow make sure that that which could be revealed, exposed, that which could bring shame to me. You protect me. And so when we see this Hebrew word, it can have all of these different meanings. It has what you saw already as far as its general use, and then it's got a specific use when it's talking about concealing or covering and not just shame, but also sin. Here, though, here in this verse, its specific use here actually means to cover or clothe the nakedness, like covering the great earth with water, covering the heavens with glory when God is doing it. When you and I are doing it, it has the idea of the understanding of covering and concealing blood. Trying to actually cover one's transgressions or inequity. And so it is pretty much solely with the concept of covering to protect or covering to make sure that, 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 that what has taken place does not bring ultimate shame. Let me give you a better way to describe it. In some sense, it is trying to say we're going to cover with the intent to camouflage. You know what camouflage is. Camouflage is where you put something on that looks like the environment around you, and so therefore you can blend in to that which is around you, even though you actually don't look like what's around you. You have covered yourself with something that makes you look like the trees or the sand or whatever it is that you are in the midst of, and therefore people cannot see you although you are there because if they saw you, they would hurt or they would harm you. What Solomon is saying here, he is saying that what love does is love will actually camouflage you in such a way that although you should be in shame, guilt, nakedness, exposed, I'm going to camouflage you in such a way that although you should be exposed to what you really are, people will not truly see you for what you really are. I'm going to cover you in camouflage because it will protect you. 
And there are times in this life, kingdom life, where you cover people in their shame. You cover them to protect them. Not because they are right, but because you simply want to help camouflage them from all that is seeking to hurt them. It says here, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all. This is the easy one, right? All simply means the whole. All. One, 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 one way it's said in writing is it covers any or every, and then in parentheses it says one place and or thing. I love that. You see, all can indicate anything that is following the word all. Don't miss that. When it says all and then is communicating the idea here, it is basically saying anything that follows after this is included in what comes along with this. But love covers all. And so when Solomon is writing this particular phrase at this point, he is actually demonstrating or letting you and I know what love has the capability of doing. What it has the capability of doing. What does that have the capability of doing here in this particular passage? Because there's something that has to follow the all. It doesn't just say all and that's it and it just leaves it there as if it just covers everything. Specifically, it tells you what it can cover all of. Transgressions. You know what transgression is, right? Transgression is simply interpreted and understood as a crime, error, fault, infraction, shortcoming, sin, or wrongdoing. All of that is a, tr- is a trespass. Now, I want to be clear here, because when you and I look at that list that is up there, you probably wouldn't have thought about crime, but guess what? Love covers that, too. All right? Some of you read this and you saw error, fault, and infraction, and you get it, shortcoming, and you really know that big three-letter word right there, sin. Because the text is clear. Transgression is sin. It is unrighteousness. It's wickedness. It's anything opposite of what God says. You see, wrongdoing is different than sin at times. Wrongdoing can just mean I offended you without offending God. Sin means I offended God whether I offended you or not. And so in this particular understanding, guess what? We cover it all. Whether I offend God and not you or whether I offend you and didn't God or whether I offend you both. Wrongdoing is a concept where I have done something that has put you in a place of negativity, hostility, anger, frustration towards me. My actions somehow have impressed upon your life or imposed upon your life in such a way that in this moment you do not like me. Because you do not like what I have done. You don't like what I have said. But Solomon says here, love covers all transgressions. And so when he makes a statement, love covers all transgressions, I want to be very, very clear about this concept of all transgressions. Notice, transgressions is not just transgression. It's plural, adding S on to it. So anybody in here who told me or comes to me when you sit down and you say, Pastor, I can't forget this person. I cannot overlook this. This is just too much. Then guess what you are saying? You're saying, I am choosing not to exercise an attitude of love towards this person because of their action. That's what you're saying. I am choosing not to love them because if I chose to love them, then guess what? It does not matter what they did, how many times they did it, or how often they have done it, or even how bad it made you feel. Guess what? Love will still cover it. Now, know some of y'all are saying, wait a minute, Pat, you just told me to be a doormat. You just told me to let somebody walk all over me, mistreat me. I said, no such thing. No such thing. I'm just repeating what Solomon says. Love covers all transgressions, offenses. Sins, wrongdoings, it covers them, okay? Put in more simpler 
phrase for you. Solomon is basically letting you and I know that love possesses the power to protect and to preserve peace. Now, don't miss that because I want you to see it very clearly. Love possesses the power, which means there is enough power in love that if you will allow it to be activated, then what will come out of your allowing it to be activated in your life is the ability to protect and to preserve peace. Protect how? Protect this person who has offended you, sinned against you, or made you upset, and at the same time still preserve peace or a relationship with them. Now let me be clear. You don't have to do this. This is not a command telling you and I what to do. You do not have to do this. But this instruction wants you to understand what you are capable of doing. What you can actually do. Put another way, we don't just say love possesses the power to protect and preserve peace, but we can also communicate it this way. Compassion can completely camouflage shortcomings. That's what it can do. That's what it can do. So the question that you and I have to ask ourselves as we are looking at the particular proverb is Solomon is making this statement about hate and about what it activates or what it initiates in the situation or circumstance, but then he gives a counter to what love can also do or what love does in some sense to a counterattack, what hate does. Hate stirs it up. Compassion covers, conceals, camouflages all shortcomings. Say it again. Hate stirs up. And when it stirs it up, now it is all up in our face for us to see and to experience. Why? Because hate was initiated by someone else's heart, and as it was initiated, it then activated animosity and hostility in your heart, and before you knew it, they said one thing, you said another. They hit you, you hit them back. They got a stick, you got a gun. Where does it stop? It does not stop because every time I am responding to an action that you have initiated that started with negative energy or hostility, it then can impact my life in such a way that I begin to respond with the same type of hostility and hate in my heart, not because it was there in the beginning, but because you have stirred it up. But what you don't realize is even if they stir it up, you and I will then keep it stirring because of what has already been stirred up. What would it look like if I poured my cup of coffee and I let it sit there and I poured the cream in and I stirred it to see it was the color to my liking, but I did not put the stir down and drink. I just kept stirring and stirring and stirring. Why? Because I was too fascinated and turned on by the fact that it was changing colors. I would always miss the enjoyment of drinking this particular cup of coffee that initially I wanted to have and to drink because something happened in the process that is causing me to miss out on the enjoyment of the relationship between me and my coffee. Solomon is saying, some of you just keep on stirring and stirring and stirring, and I'm trying to tell you how you can stop the stir so you can enjoy the relationship in which you ultimately wanted to be in. You have to say to yourself, self, even though this fool of mine has stirred up strife, 
I'm going to settle the strife by camouflaging, covering their foolishness, their sin, their wrongdoing, and I'm not going to let it be the thing that I continue to stir up. Why? Because I will cover it. Well, Pastor Boy, how long I got to do it? The question is, how long do you want peace? When you love somebody, you will protect the relationship. But you also want peace in that relationship. Last night, my wife and I got into a little tiff. I was trying to help her out with something. She was walking through the house and trying to lock the door, sliding the screen door in the back of the house. I locked it, but it was only kind of halfway locked. You know, the lock has got some issues, and so, you know, it don't always lock like it's supposed to, but it was locked. And so she says, uh, did you, like, did you pull the little thing in, the little lever, and make sure it locked, lock? I said, that's good enough. And I locked the back lock, so we're good. She's like, no, see, you're going to, see, you're going to mess around and make that thing even more broken. And so she walks over. to the sliding screen door. And she's standing there, but it's dark. Because it's late, it's late. So I turn the light on. Well, when I turn the light on, she's standing there and not very much clothing. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> to which, when I see this, I get a little aroused. Something wakens up. Because <laughs> I didn't know she was looking like that. Now, my motivation was to help her see what she was doing. In the process, it activated something that was lying dormant for a few seconds. She looked at me and she said, turn the light off. I ain't got no clothes on. Now, in her mind, she didn't say it that loud. But in my ears, that's how, we, that's how I heard it. I said, you know what? Fine, fine, fine. Flipped off the light and walked on downstairs. Then this doggone proverb. <laughs> Came back to mind. See, I think she was a little perturbed because the light was on when I turned it on and she was standing the way where she was. And so it initiated an initial response from her that was a little more aggressive than normal responses, which then activated and stirred up what? Some animosity in my own actions and activity. I said, y'all, I knew I had to apologize. She didn't do anything wrong. I mean, she did some wrong stuff. I was wrong. She didn't sin, but I was wrong. However, I don't like going to bed upset and angry. Not to mention God's word. He always has a way of, like, using it against me. (laughs) So I walked into the bedroom. I said, you know what? Listen, listen. Overreacted. I'm sorry. To which she rode, she said, no problem, laid down, and went to sleep. Hmm. What well, could have been an exciting night because of what had been around. <laughs> I missed out on because I did not truly function out of love where I was covering, concealing, and just simply moving past the wrongdoing that I felt. I don't think she meant to stir anything up, but I definitely kept it stirring. And so this morning, I confess before you all, I share with my wife, that was not an appropriate apology. I am sorry for the way in which I responded to you In the future, I will seek to better cover and camouflage your bad attitude that comes out. (laughs) And your angry actions, all right? (laughs) 
Kingdom Life, what is your takeaways for today? Your takeaways are very, very simple this morning. Number one, Solomon wants you and I to understand something. He wants us to cognitively be aware of this, okay? And cognitively, because I need you to intellectually understand this principle. This is not a command about how you should live. This is not an instruction about, hey, do this, don't do that. He is simply making you and I cognitively aware of what the energy emanating from our emotions, okay? Your emotions are legitimate, they're real, they're acceptable, they're okay. Your emotions, anger is even a legitimate, uh, rational, acceptable emotion at times. But you need to understand whatever you are feeling, it emanates. It emanates. And it creates energy in the situation. All right? What you also need to know is this. This is your second takeaway because when you understand that, 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 that your emotions will, will energize, that your emotions will emanate from you and then create energy in a situation. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It could be at work. It could be at home. It could be all by yourself driving down the street in your car. Somebody could actually look at you while you're driving and give you a dirty look or honk at you, and it, it will create emotions, right? You've been there before at the stoplight, and it turned green, and then somebody honk at you because you was looking at your phone and you mad at them? <laughs> you mad at them. You was one not paying attention, That's right. all right? But you mad at them because they, they, they prompted you. They now provoked you to move forward because you weren't moving fast enough and you angry. And some of y'all have been the person who was sitting behind somebody and you honked the horn because you were in such a rush, you don't realize maybe they got distracted. Do you really think they were sitting there to try to make you wait? They want to go as bad as you want to go. They missed it, but you're going to honk the horn and be like, honk, honk, and then roll up past like, what's wrong with you? All right, what, what are you doing? All right? All of, that stirring up, all of that energy and emotions being stirred up by your actions, all right? Or your actions are being stirred up by your emotions, okay? You need to understand that, all right? So emotions, they are legitimate. You will have them, okay? But they do emit energy. So here's a question. Will yours be hostility that is helped by hatred? Okay? Will your attitude and your anger activate further animosity, anger, antagonism in the situation? See, I don't really care if you're the initiator or the reactor. Because the good thing about this particular proverb is it doesn't matter which one you are, you have an opportunity to do one or the other. And you know how you combat what, the one that's happening if you don't want it to happen? You just simply do the other. And what's the other? Will you let compassion that protects and preserves be that which flows from the energy of the emotions in which you possess? Because I'm here to tell you, to many of us, missed a whole lot of good nights. <laughs> let me pray for you. This is the one. <laughs> Hear it, believe it, and receive it. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are, how you continue to work in all of our lives. You are good, you are God, you are holy. We get the awesome privilege and opportunity of calling you God of heaven. Not just God of heaven, but our God who loves us and created us. We get the privilege of not only knowing this and being able to call you God, but we can call you Father, Abba, making it personal. Because you are not a God who is distant. You are not just a God who reigns and rules sovereignly from heaven. You are a God who is also a father, who passionately has pursued us, your children, who has also carefully, carefully crafted a plan to bring us back into reconciliation with you. I know God in heaven, I believe that this proverb in some sense is talking about just that for many of us, how we can walk in a constant state of reconciliation with people, with loved ones, with the circumstances in our life that at times will provoke or prompt anger, frustration, even pain. See, in this life, there will be pain, there will be trials, there will be trouble, there will be struggles, there will be suffering, there will be all these things. We can't escape them, but how we respond to them is important. And we want to be a people. We want to be a people who do not continuously stir up strife, whether we are the initiators of it or we are the responders to it. God, we desire to be a people who will constantly cover and conceal, camouflage the transgressions. And God, I want to be clear about this. We're not trying to cover up sin so that that way we hide it from you. No, the Bible is very clear. Confess your sins one to another. 
It is clear that we have to acknowledge sin. We got to run away from it. But there are times in our relationships with one another that we do some things that are wrong towards one another. They are sometimes malicious, but sometimes, Lord, they are just simply accidents that are happening because we live in a sinful, fallen world. And God, you are telling us how we can relate to one another in a similar way as you've related to us. You've camouflaged our sins. You've covered them. God, you've paid the price for them. And although they're still there, although there are times we still commit them, God, you do not give us the same condemnation as a result of them. You demonstrate your compassion. You demonstrate your ability to cover. God, you overwhelm us with your love. Help us to not only be overwhelmed, but to also overwhelm. So that that way, oh God in heaven, we will not only cognitively understand what is happening, but we will be able to combat it for that which could be happening. God, we thank you and praise you because you are worthy. You are worthy. God, you are so worthy. We are so undeserving. Yet God, You make the undeserving deserving by your worthiness. So we thank you for today. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for your word that comes to us, that we may better, better walk in greater obedience, humility, and honor of you. We give you all praise, all glory, and all honor, asking all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. All God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Listen, this morning, if you want to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, the Bible declares that you and I are sinners in need of a Savior. And sinner just simply means you've messed up, you've missed the mark, you're not perfect. In fact, you can never be perfect. But God, the sovereign God of the world, the creator of this all, perfect and holy in righteousness, loved you enough that he wanted to find a way to cover your sins cover your offenses that you and I have committed against him. It does not matter what the offense is. See, love can cover it all. And if God is trying to get us to to see each other through the lens of love, he's really trying to get us to see us and one another through the same lens that he often will see us through, and that's love. The Bible declares that if you want to Go to heaven when you die. If you want to know for sure that when this life comes to an end, even in all your imperfection, you will still be with the perfect one then you must believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down here from heaven to earth. He lived a perfect life, and then he died on the cross, shedding his blood to cover your sins, every last one of them. Today, if you want to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, if this is you this morning, pray this prayer with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed, repeat after me. God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. Yeah, I've made mistakes. I've messed up. I've been wrong just as I have been wronged. But today, I make the decision to invite Jesus Christ, the Son of God, into my life. And while I don't know what all that means today, I know that it means this one thing. That if I died today, I'd be with you for eternity in heaven. Lord, come into my heart. Change my life. Make me more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who want to recommit your life today, you want to rededicate. Like the prodigal son or daughter, you've wandered away and you kind of strayed for a season. You, you've grown up in church or you have been to a place where you believed already and you just found yourself, life just getting the best of you because life was just simply happening. And you were enjoying it, loving it. But it's gotten to the point where you no longer love the life that you were living. You want the life that, that, that Christ has died for you to live. So you want to return back home with the prodigal son or daughter. You want to recommit yourself. There's a prayer for you also. If that's you, pray this prayer with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Repeat after me. My Father and my God in heaven, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for keeping me whole, even when I wandered away. Today, I return back home, 
once again placing my hand, placing my hand in yours, asking that you would lead me, that you would lead me the rest of the way home. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to Kingdom Life Church's YouTube channel. Yes, thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We hope to see you here in person sometime soon. God bless.